everyone, welcome to Lentolytics 46. That's what Dan told me this morning. And so I just have a host checklist that I'm going to run through. First of all, my name is Carmen Velasquez and I recently joined Dark Horse Analytics. And while I'm not uh, Dan, no one else is Dan, I'm gonna try and do a good hosting job here today. So today we're talking about using data to improve public safety. So we have a couple of really good speakers, three good speakers in fact, and we'll talk about crime analysis. We'll talk about emergency services with ambulances, as well as I'm gonna do some from, someone from Women in Big Data. But first, I wanna acknowledge our sponsor. So Dark Horse is the founder of Lunch Olympics but we also have ATB, Go Auto, the Nate Computing Training Center, and Alberta Data Partnerships, as well as Startup Edmonton, to thank for the free lunch and free venue and all the learnings that we have here today. Okay, if you, um, you can, you're here live, but not everyone can make it live. There are lots of people on the wait list, as well as people whose plans change, and so you can follow us if you're unable to make it in the future on live stream, and that's what all the cameras and microphones are here for. So I'll get started, and I'm going to do, introduce Dana, Diana Shaw first, and she is a consultant with the Edmonton Police Service, but also the founder of the Alberta Chapter for Women in Big Data, and so that's something that's trying to get, an initiative that we're trying to get off the ground, so I'll let you uh, talk for a few minutes before other speakers. Thank you, Carmen. Um, can everyone hear me? Hopefully. So as mentioned by Carmen, um, I am the, the lead for Women in Big Data, the Alberta chapter. So this is the website, um, or the web page and the logo somewhere when it comes up. Uh, we started this organization uh, last year at the Data Asset Management Conference, and um, the Women in Big Data was actually started off by three individuals in Intel, trying to in increase diversity within the data analytics and big data field. They um, also wanted to increase diversity generally, not just women, um, and they, it was started off by ZMR, and um, I'm going to forget their names because they're um, uh, rather difficult to pronounce. And so th within three years, they have increased to 15 chapters around the world with over 7,000 members. And um, we're trying to get the, the group up within Alberta. So if anyone's interested, please come and see me afterwards and I can give you a, a card. I am actually now on the Women in Big Data um, website, their front page. Um, looking wonderful. And um, why would you join? Well, it is um, more of a virtual and an in-person opportunity to meet up, to engage and to grow the opportunities and diversity of um, people within big data and analytics. Um, you can also be a partner, which means that you would um, have the opportunity to A, showcase what you are doing from ideally within your own company, um, in, the, in increasing diversity within the big data and anal analytics field. Um, you can also become, some of the uh, partners, by the way, include women in, in data science. I've got the list here. Uh, women in data science, Netflix, Walmart, um, Linux, and Cisco. So these are big entities. And some of the sponsors include, like I said, it started off with the uh, three individuals within Intel. They've got big following from IBM. Um, you can read for yourself equally as well as I can speak. Um, LinkedIn. So these are really big organizations around the world who are trying to increase diversity within the big data and analytics field. So um, like I said, we're hoping to get this up and running a bit more regularly within Alberta. And we decided that between Calgary and Edmonton, it wasn't big enough to have two entities, so this is why it's Women in Big Data Alberta chapter. So if you're interested in coming to any of the events, helping me get it really up and started and underway, please come and see me or go to the Women in Big Data website. I was telling Heather I can't search for that at Edmonton Police because linking uh, big and women in the same sentence when you're searching is not good. Um, so <laughs> if you look at womeninbigdata.org, I think it is, um, come and find me on the, on the internet that way or have a LinkedIn account or find me now and I'll give you a business card and hopefully we can get this up and running within Alberta. Thank you. Yeah. 
thanks, Heather, for the intro. And I will kind of give an additional plug is that I find as someone who's into this industry, it's hard to know where to start sometimes. And there's a lot of resources on that website to help you get started. All right, so without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. So Heather Hlus is the manager of crime section analysis for the Edmonton Police Service. And she's going to be presenting today on how to catch a thief. Good morning, everybody. So all the presentations coming up. So um, as noted, I am the manager for the crime analysis section with the Edmonton Police Service. And when I was asked to do this presentation, I kind of looked at big data and what, what we do as crime analysts and how do I talk about what takes us sometimes weeks or months to do in 15 minutes. So I'm going to just give you a really high level of really what the analyst does in the Edmonton Police Service, the data that we have access to and how we use that data really to come up with um, an offender or a suspect in a series of, I just use break and enters, um, because when we talk about public and community safety, that is one of the crime types that really affects communities and we really care and, and these are the things that really affect us um, as far as crime analysis and the analysts go as well. So we'll get started. Um, so to catch a thief, so the Edmonton Police Service, um, they employ criminal intelligence analysts to collect, collate, analyze, and disseminate intelligence. And really, we want to support our tactically, our frontline members, our investigative units, and also identify long-term pro uh, problems within our communities that need to be addressed. And really, we just want to support EPS. We want to prevent crimes, and we want to stop them from happening. And the analysts are really passionate about this. This has been one of my passions for the last 11 years that I've worked for the Edmonton Police Service. Um, and we really care about what we do. So how much data is too much data? And really, the Edmonton Police Service in 2018 took over 190,000 calls for service. So that's what the analysts deal with um, over a year. And really, we, all we want is more, because even with all what we have, it's not enough to get us to what we need um, as an end result. And I'll kind of walk you through those processes of what we, look like, what we look at. And that's everything from a mischief to a homicide. And we have analysts that deal with everything. Like I said, I'm going to kind of focus in on that break and enter kind of scenario, because that's a little bit easier to um, understand as well. So we really need to understand the data that we deal with as analysts every day. Um, there's the 911, the calls for service that come in, plus there's some online reporting. Um, we've also got over uh, 1,900 sworn members that are writing reports, taking calls, and submitting those calls and reports into a record management system. It's that record management system that we really base so much um, of what we do on. Um, one of the issues with our data is, you can imagine, um, there's structured data and there's unstructured data. And structured data is really nice, and I'll kind of show you some of our databases that help us deal with the structured stuff. It's the unstructured stuff, and that's the good stuff about um, the things that are really going on within um, a, a crime that we need to have access to as well. And how do we manage that? And how do we use that data at the same time as with the structured? Um, and then there's lots of other issues with the data um, and how we kind of deal with that as well. Uh, so managing the data in the databases. So we're really lucky with the Edmonton Police Service because we do have some technologies in place that really help sort through the data initially for the analysts. Um, spreadsheets is one of the things that we always refer to. We use a lot of spreadsheets. Um, we have some internal databases. But we also have Cognos, which really turns our data into information. We have a GIS um, Esri platform as well. And then we use IBM products as well. So that really helps us um, deal with what we're looking at. The only problem is that a lot of those databases aren't integrated together. So everything kind of happens independently. And then we still have to pull everything together manually, um, which is kind of fun. But it also affects the timeliness of what we're doing. And you can imagine when you have somebody, and we've identified that there is somebody breaking into houses, time is of an essence. Really, we want to not have the least amount of victims is really what we're striving to do. We want to stop this from happening. So really, what is crime analysis? I'll do a really brief overview of that. So information is just a statement of fact. Analysis is part of the process to get to the intelligence or get to that offender of what's actually happening. 
Um, we use the intelligence cycle as analysts to get to our conclusions. And our data really in that collection and collation part of this are, are just absolutely primary in the function of this intelligence process. And that's really what our data supports is that collection and collation. And then just a quick de definition of criminal intelligence analysts, and I kind of went through that at the beginning of the presentation. But really, we're analyzing the data on people and places to understand it, uh, um, the victims, the offenders, the criminal organizations, everything that goes around it so that we can make the best recommendations on how to stop or disrupt the activity. So how do you identify a problem? So we have a record management system that has over 11 million different pieces of information. So how do you even start knowing what to look for and to figure out that there's actually even a problem occurring in an area? And EPS has come up, up with some ways to help deal with that that we currently use. Um, we know that there are some issues with that too and we're always trying to improve that. Um, it's never um, a constant state, it's always in a constant state of how do we make this better and how do we integrate our data a lot better. So one of the things is that we have six divisions um, within the Edmonton Police Service as well that help kind of sort that data out so that we're dealing with smaller chunks of data. And the other one is the eight crime indicators that we assess. So that ends up focusing us on certain crime types that seem to have the most effect on community safety. So at least we're not looking at everything, we're looking at things that specifically might need to be addressed to help with our community safety. So when we look at where the problems are, as you can see, there's the six divisions within EPS. We have each division has analytical support and that is their role. So they look specifically at crimes in those divisions. So that helps them manage that data a little bit better. Um, and they can also understand those divisional differences when it comes to industrial factors, are there corporate, commercial, whatever that looks like. Because the data is going to reflect what that area actually looks like. And you see that when you deal with that kind of data all the time, is that you learn as analytically, you see things and you know that that's, that's a result of what is happening or maybe even the demographics that's going on in a, in a certain division. One of the problems with this that we're really finding right now is we're trying to look at bigger pictures is that we create silos of information. So once you create a silo of information, how do you unsilo it? And how do you bring it back together with all the other silos that are happening within? Um, and putting those pieces of data together now on that bigger scale and seeing how they mesh together and how they interact together and if they're similar or not. Um, so that's another issue that we work through. Um, there's lots of communication, there's lots of teamwork for sure to help this happen. Uh, so another thing that we have and we're really lucky to have is our Cognos software to really help identify what the problem is. So Cognos is a system that'll take all those reports and all those different things and they can create different sorts of reports. And analysts can use, and I, I can't even tell you how many reports they create because there's a lot out there. But different analysts use different reports depending on what they're trying to answer. So that's the first thing. We find out, yes, we have a problem in the, in the, in the division, say it's break and enters. Okay, now we need that data that's going to help us identify what exactly is going on and who exactly is doing it. So now we can start pulling reports and those reports will give us different ideas about is there trends that are happening in that area, is it something we see all the time, is it seasonal? And then we can get specific information as well um, that helps the analysts deal with that information to come up with a conclusion. So the analyst, analysis of information, so analysts all have a toolbox to deal with this data. So once we have the data, we've identified a problem, we've got a big spreadsheet with however many events that we're trying to figure out and sort through. Now there's a little bit of a manual process that goes on. There's reading of reports, there's pulling more information out of there. There's adding into spreadsheets or into our IBM pro, um, programs like iBase to kind of collate that data so we can really have a look and see what's, what's going on there. So sometimes we get surveillance pictures so we can actually see what their MO is. We can see how they're breaking into things. That's going to link those pieces of data together. Um, analysts rely very heavily on the, the qualities of the offender. They're very unique. Offenders tend to do 
what they do when they get good at it and they don't change that behavior very often unless sometimes we've intervened or they've learned something better. So we rely very heavily on MO. We can look at hotspot mapping so we can look at those occurrences and we can see where they're happening and we can start really starting to target down and narrow down where police might need to be. We can look at the times of day that they seem to be attacking, that they seem to be going. Now we can now look even closer at where resources need to be and times that they're going to be. And then we can look at time of day as well and we can say, okay, well we know they, they're most active at this time of night, on these days of week, in these hot spots. So you can see already we're starting to narrow down from a whole pile of information to very, very specific knowledge of a criminal's behavior. And then we can also look at other things in the toolbox as um, what's connected to what else in the past. So another thing, while the analyst is doing all this stuff and putting all these pieces of data together and understanding, what they also have in their background is the theories of crime that support the behaviors of the offenders. And really these theories help us generalize those patterns and help define what's going on. And there's a whole bunch, and I'm not going to do a criminology course here on the theories of crime, but every offender, these theories of crime may apply for that. So that helps us further take that data, take that problem, take that crime series, and now we're looking at that offender that might do that type of crime. What is it about that location and then about that offender that might be you know, inspiring and motivating them for breaking into these houses. So finding the offender. So once everything is done, this is the point is we really, we understand um, we can put some resources into an area, we can kind of do that. But at the end of the day, we really want to find out who is committing these crimes. We want to arrest somebody or we want to help somebody. Um, we want to make the community safer. We want the victims of these <coughs> crimes to feel like okay, I can sleep at night again. Um, so after we've got all these things done, now these are the resources that the analysts will use now to really pick out who is doing the crimes. And a lot of that comes from what kind of property are they stealing? Are they stealing video games? Um, because then we might tend to say, okay, maybe we're looking more at a youth or a young adult. Are they stealing jewelry? Uh, small electronics, okay, they might be on foot, they might be riding a bike, they might live closer to this residence that we think. Are they stealing big electronics, um, big screen TVs, heavier computers, that sort of thing. Okay, then they have a vehicle. So now you can see how we're starting to use what the offender does to start looking back. And we can look at, we've got some internal police databases that we store um, criminal, crim offenders that have done crimes and how they've done it so we can start linking them back. We can start linking at how viable they are. We can contact probation. We can see who lives in those areas that might be out right now, that might be active. Um, we can talk, a lot of it is uh, police opinion. What are, what are our patrol officers seeing on the street? Who are they interacting with? Um, agencies that might be interacting with some offenders. Everybody that's involved in this process has a piece of information that's going to contribute to the end product. So it's not just data, now it's all these other thoughts and opinions um, and other pieces of opinions that have been linked in other databases that the analyst starts to pull in as well. And then they sort through all of that. And once they get through all of that, usually at the end of the day, they can come up with a list of possibilities. And I only say possibilities because we never have all the data, we never have all the information. And really, unless we've got some really great surveillance video, and if you want to invest in a good ring doorbell or you know, a video camera doorbell, which is really helpful um, to help with surveillance, so we can actually say, hey, this guy actually matches who we think it is. Um, those types of things really happen. But I would say that, that it's very rare that we get those types of pieces of information that are that easy. It's never that easy. 
Um, so as you can see, there's lots and lots of data. There's lots of things that need to be considered when an analyst goes through this process. And at the end of the day, and I'll tell you, every week analysts are coming up with these conclusions and they're doing, what we usually do is we'll do some sort of briefing. So, you know, the, the patrol officers or whoever needs to know the office uh, information, they get briefed on exactly what's going on, where it's happening, who we think what they might be doing it, why we think they are doing it. Um, we might do an offender profile where we can describe, okay, this is the person, this is where we think they live, this is who they're associating with, these are the vehicles they drive, these are the way they commit their crimes. And we really get down to the nitty gritty specifics from 190,000 calls for service. Um, and then we go to our operational units and we present that. And we hope that, you know what, they have the resources as well now to say, okay, we're gonna look into that and we're gonna find this guy and, and uh, we're gonna be successful. And sometimes we're right. Um, it is analysis and like our, I said, one of our biggest struggles is we never have all the information, we never have all the facts. Um, if we did, our jobs would be really, really easy. But this whole process really can take weeks. And um, the analysts that are passionate, they, they are diggers, they are finders, and they never give up on this. And one of the, the biggest things um, about the data is, and I always say is, let the data speak to you, because it'll tell you what you need to know. You just need to make sure you have what you need and where to find it. Because when you have enough of it, it will tell you that's intelligence. And it will tell you who is doing what, what they're doing. And, um, and we do have a lot of access and we do have a lot of support. That's why we have an ever-growing analytical team with the EPS. And it's very exciting. So um, just a couple of final thoughts. I am a Star Trek fan and, and, uh, and you know, I made the joke before I did this presentation that I wasn't going to, you know, blog all this Star Trek stuff because I do love Star Trek. And, and one of the things is, um, you know, really from uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, but Spock uses his references a lot. If you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And really, that's what analysts do. They take out all that stuff that they don't think is right and whatever is left. <coughs> then this should be it. This should be the answer. And that's the best we do. And, and we have a lot of success with that. And it's a really exciting um, journey to catch the thief in the end. And that's everything. Right, so now we will be taking some questions for Heather. I think that's one of the biggest things is understanding what the data is um, and what is being reflected in that. And one of the things I always say, and we kind of talked about this earlier, is um, with analysts, with statistics, even in policing, really, we can make any problem a problem and we can make any problem not a problem. And understanding the biases was one of the biggest things. And like I said, really, the data has to speak for you, it has to speak. Um, it's not the analyst that speaks, it's the data that speaks and the data that guides the conclusions. And uh, that's what we really tend to focus on. So it really tr eliminates those types of biases because the d if the data doesn't support a bias, it can't support a bias. And we can't intercede in that to say, well, it's this, when we don't have the data that's gonna support that conclusion. 
Um, so that's kind of how we, we work through most of those problems is we really try to focus on what is the data supporting, not what are we thinking. That makes sense. <laughs> Bruce? Um, you noted that with all the analysis it does take time and there seems to be a, you know, a delay between when getting information and when you can act on it. And I had a, in my neighborhood recently, a, a neighbor of mine had a, a really nice bicycle stolen from his garage. And so he discovered it was gone in the morning and then just by chance went on Kijiji and there it was uh, within hours of it being stolen. So do you see opportunities or kind of a direction of trying to get this more on a real-time basis where you can use social media or whatever to just Absolutely. Um, you know, that's always our biggest struggle, right? And especially with technology that the criminals can use, that throws a whole different wrench in how we're going to do this and how we track problems. It used to be pawns, right? We could go to a pawn store and we could find the stolen property with online buy and sells, Kijiji, all those different things that makes it very, very difficult to track. Um, because it's, it gets stolen and so, sold so, so quickly in, in a lot of circumstances. Um, you know what? Right now, we don't have a solution for that. We have officers that are dedicated to looking at those types of things. But, you know, really, it is as it comes in. Yeah. Is it a priority, though, to try to shorten the cycles? or is it? Just it's always a priority for us to try to shorten those cycles. Absolutely. Um, timeliness is the biggest thing, right? And... Uh, being part of the analytical uh, side of the Edmonton Police Service, we read so many calls, so we read about the victims every day. And it is, it's frustrating even um, for anybody working in EPS to learn or hear we have another victim because that's what we, our goal is to not have that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, the, the end goal is we need this as soon as possible. And like I said, the analysts that I deal with, they'll, they'll work late. They'll, especially if they're like, I think I got it, they will work until they find that answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Your question? Um, how do you measure success? So given the timelines that you're dealing with, you know, what's the end result, like an arrest, a conviction, a drop in crime rate, um, how do you know whether you're winning? Exactly. <laughs> That's a hard one to measure, and I think we've struggled mm -hmm. with that as well. Uh, from even an analytical side of things um, because what is success is putting somebody in jail actually a success and I don't know if it is um, it, and that might not be how we measure that success right um, and we definitely look at that at the end of the day reduction in victimology I think is a success the community feedback saying yes we feel safer in our communities is a success um, the fact that we're there, and I don't know if there's a specific measure. Um, reduction of crime is obviously one of those factors, absolutely. Um, but sometimes it's hard to measure if the crime didn't happen, was it because we did something or just because it didn't happen? And that's always a struggle is how do we actually quantify those types of instances? And we just go with, we hope that we were right. And we'll hopefully see that in the end result with a reduction in crime in the future if we're doing our jobs the way that we need to do them. So. Do, you, do you do any technique to close the loop? Take an example from the, from the loop of turning <coughs> information uh, management. There was a case where you have uh, cars with a locker. When the car was stolen, it would signal a radio signal and you could target where the car is. Uh, so kind of putting uh, things to be stolen, actually, mm -hmm. like the kind of facilitating for the... In those regions, you have a hot, hot maps there. Yeah, so, so catch. there are investigative steps and strategies that mm -hmm. the Edmonton police will use, and that's just on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what the analysis may, is maybe saying to say, this might be a strategy right now. Um, especially if we don't know who's doing the crime, but we want to do something before that. You know, there are bait vehicles, there are different things and different strategies that can be used, um, depending, but that's that operational side. Um, we kind of just deal with 
you know, let's bring forward the problem and the offenders. And then, you know, that operational side is the operational side. And, so we separate. And it, you don't have... Uh, we, we talk, but, you know, and that's the thing. Like, oh, there is a constant feedback with that. Whatever the operational side does, you know, did that stop the crime? No, it didn't. So we keep on looking at that analysis piece until that ends, right? That doesn't stop. Um, that's that continuation of, okay, what's going on and what do we need to do? And those conversations just happen. Uh, naturally every single day, yeah. One final question. So, when you collect the evidence, mm -hmm. right, let's say, you know, the fact, the facts, factors, you know, witnesses, uh, bits and pieces of information, do you have any uh, sort of probabilistic framework where actually put it all together and put that analysis, or is it more of a kind of human intelligence project that's just it, analyzing this fast about facts? Yeah, kind of mostly human, um, most of that because our systems don't integrate with each other, it's a spreadsheet. And a lot of that is that collation piece. Um, we definitely, there are some things that we're getting better at using some of our products, um, but it's just how much can you, can, can you get in. And a lot of when we talk about offenders and crimes, um, a lot of it isn't a number, it's not a count, it's a behavior. There's so much of um, the qualitative pieces of that, that you know, that, that human aspect, the analysis really plays a big part in that and understanding it's hard that. To, the structure of this, uh, this data. Right? That's right. We, could use some, like, kind of data, uh, we, we try to structure it as much as we can, as right? Um, but that only goes so far. <laughs> and then the other side has to pay it, play a part in. And a lot of that we look at is those human factors of that offender really is, you know, what is driving, what is the root cause of their behavior, and how do you structure addiction, right? How do you structure some of these things that, you know, they're not, they're not in that way. You, ha you just have to consider them, so. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for keeping us safe. So before we load the next up presentation, just a couple of housekeeping items. So one is I'm, I'm a host today that's new, and I'm going to actually ask you to do a bit of work at the end of the day, because one of the things I find is that at the end of the session, we spend a lot of time putting all the chairs back. So for this free lunch and free lunch and learn and exchange, I'm going to ask you at the end of the session today to just grab your chair and actually stack it along this wall, and that saves me and my colleagues a lot of work. The second thing is that Startup Edmonton does have uh, another meeting in this room starting at 1.30, so they've asked us to please uh, exit by 1.15, so I'm going to cut it off at 1. I know everyone likes to ask lots of questions after, but if you can do that outside, uh, that would be really helpful. All right, so some other stuff on my list. Um, is anyone looking for a job in the data science field? Is anyone hiring in the data science field? Can you say who you're with? ATB, perfect. Okay, so if anyone is looking for um, work, ATB, and then Edmonton Police Service as well. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so there you go, helping with that. And uh, one of the other things I'd like to ask um, is also if you have any suggestions for topics. I know we're always, always looking for new themes, and if anyone has anything that they'd like to present on, true story, I always get this job at Dark Horse. I presented at Lunchalytics one of the first times that they held this, and that's how the conversation started. So you too can get a job this way. All right. Okay, so now our second presenter is with Dark Horse Analytics. We also have a service called Dark Horse Emergency Services that Rob will talk about. So I'll pass it over to Rob. Thanks, Carmen. So Dark Horse Emergency is one of our divisions that's developed over the years as we started doing more and more fire and EMS clients. Edgar, man, it's been like 20 years. We live together. This is amazing. <laughs> All right, we'll chat afterwards. Okay. Um, and somehow it's ended up in my lap, so I'm mostly responsible under Dan's guidance to guide and direct emergency to be a successful division within Dark Horse. Um, today we're going to talk about deployment modeling. So it's, it's been a process. We've, we've gotten decent at it. I think I lost the clicker here. Hold on. Um, and I'm going to walk you through our, our development process and our thinking and where we've ended up. So if you've heard any of Dan's talks, he talks about certain aspects of analytics. And this would be a pres prescriptive 
process. Does this work? Yes. And I will be going off my notes. Um, okay, so as a refresher, what's the main purpose of a fire, fire service? Anybody? Fire service. Fire fires, which is one, one level up. Save lives, save property, right? Um, and so we've focused our work mostly on response performance analytics, which is helping fire services get to calls quicker. As we know, if you get to a call quicker, there's better probability of saving a life, saving property. Um, and one of the pieces of that is proper strategic deployment of resources. So placement of stations, uh, placement of units, placement of fire firefighters within those units. Um, so we are going to make up a story here. This is College Town. Now, who wants to be a pretend fire chief for the next 30 minutes? Come on. You, what's your name? Yeah. Sarah. Sarah? We have Chief Sarah. <laughs> chief Sarah, she's new to College Town. She's brought on. She's inherited four stations, five units, and 18 firefighters. Uh, she's, she's getting familiar with the city. This is our, our fire stations and the units, placements. But she, she doesn't know why these units are placed like this. And she's, she's interested, interest, interested, you know, making sure the deployment is right. So she brought on Dark Horse Analytics. Um, and so the first question she, we ask is, well, where do we start? Where, where would we start? Um, you know, and historically, the equidist, oh, there, forgot about this slide. <laughs> simplest model always wins. But sometimes the simplest can't be attained. There's layers of complexity. So we move to the simpler model. Um, sorry. And we look at a, the equidistance approach. So historically, that's been the approach with uh, lack of data. Maybe you divide your city into grids, and you place stations equidistance apart, covering ground. Um, but what are what are problems with this? Anyone? It doesn't consider the actual traffic situation. Traffic. Um, yes. No. First, demand is our call, fire calls, emergency calls. Are they equally spaced? No, probably not. Right. So, so next we got to move to uh, what we call a gravity model. So, we do a demand call demand analysis. We figure out where calls are happening, and then we can start to we can think about maybe placing stations where where there are a lot of calls, right? This is kind of an inverse graph. We'll say that the, the dip is where there's most calls, right? So that, you know, that would dictate that we should, we should put our resources there. Um, this could get us into trouble too as we think about it more. Um, one, this only applies to stations, right? Units are placed within stations, but in this case, Sarah has five units and four stations. Where does she put that fifth unit? Um, and probably more important, it, it doesn't account for natural boundaries, um, rivers, other maybe high elevations, traffic congestion. Um, so now we're, we're going, okay, we got, we got to go another, add a layer of complexity here. So we're going to build a road network. So this road network for us is creating a drive time matrix between stations and demands, looking at point to point looking at, okay, how quickly, what's the shortest path uh, that we can get to a, a point. All right, so now, now we're getting, we're getting more, more pleased with, with our model. Uh, but we may have some problems here. One, maybe we have poor station locations. Maybe stations were built 30 years ago when the city has drastically changed, right? And, um, Hold on, hold on. Um, we can, uh, well, and the technology today. We got, we got Google. We have lots of open source tools to build a pretty good road network. 
But if we just use our, our open source data, we're treating all vehicles the same, right? Fire service vehicles, they operate a little bit differently, right? They accelerate slower, probably takes them longer to get to closer calls, um, but they could get to a, a call that's further away faster than an average, average vehicle. Um, so we got to add another layer of complexity. And what would that be? Specific um, mm -hmm. speed parameters for your fire vehicles. So looking at the historical call volumes, looking, breaking your city into neighborhoods. So we know like downtown will have um, a different traffic patterns than say suburban areas. So we're, we're b building yeah, not only specific to fire vehicles, but specific to areas, speed parameters. Um, and that, well, we're getting better. We're like right on the edge of moving. Um, you know, we, maybe we could even get, get away with some of these, for stopping here. But um, we're not taking into account uh, variability. So the speed parameters gives us the average drive time. Right? We, we can get, we know that it'll take us you know, just over three minutes to get anywhere in the city on average. But is, is that true? Like, will we always get somewhere in three minutes? Not likely. Well, average will not be the best. Right, average, it, it's, it's not based on reality. So reality is, okay, so our target is five minutes 90% of the time. Well, we've got a bunch of calls that we're not getting to. Um, I can feel that Dan wants to interrupt. But that's okay. That's okay. Um, so if we if we don't include for variability, we're going to be tempted to uh, place our vehicles too far apart. All right? We're going to overestimate our the their ability to respond. Um, and so we add drive time variability to the model. And now I think we've, we've nailed it. We've, we've done a pretty good job at dealing with proximity. All right, so we've, we've got the proximity problem under control. However, there's also availability. So just because we have a truck assigned to a station doesn't mean it's, it's always there. You know, depending on the service, it might be out on a call. Uh, maybe it's in for maintenance, right? Old vehicles. You know, you'd like to see 80%, 90% availability, but, but it's not always true. So this is where our model um, gets way, way too complex for me. Uh, we've, we've solved this. We've uh, incorporated um, Susan Budge's doctoral thesis. She's done some incredible work. Um, she's from the U of A. I don't know if she's still there. And um, yeah, it's, I can't talk to this, but Corey, is Corey here? Corey's one of my lead developers on the project. He understands it, and I actually call it Corey's code because he's made some tweaks. So we're, we're pretty proud of Corey. Um, so we won't get into this, but we've added it to our model because we know that proximity is just part of the problem. So combining that with the availability issue now now we're pleased. Now we can go to Chief Sarah after we've looked at all our data and go, okay, um, we're close. But there's a few other complexities, right? We can look at, you know, maybe station capacity. Maybe the station is 50 years old and there's one bay and there's no room to build on another bay. So we're, we might be limited to, to one truck in that one station. Um, risk, you know, maybe calls are, are pretty concentrated in one area, but there's one neighborhood that the occupancy risk is, is very high. We're looking at, you know, maybe the, it's higher risk for fire. We don't know. Effective response force is a, is a beast that we're currently working through. And with fire services, not only do they need to get to the call quickly, but they have, um, they call them full, full alarm assignments. So depending on their target, they might say, we need 15 firefighters at this call in, 10 minutes. Maybe their target is five minutes for first due, but 10 minutes we need 15 or 20. I think Vancouver for their high risk fires, 
they have 39 firefighters in 12 minutes needs to arrive on scene. So that, that adds a whole, whole other dimension. Politics, that's far more diffi difficult to model. Uh, that will be on Chief Sarah to figure out. <laughs> um, and so we've got a pretty powerful model. We're happy with it. And then the biggest challenge is how do I communicate this to Chief Sarah? How do I give her the ability to communicate it and sell it to council? Um, and so that's where we've, over the years, we've iterated, we've changed a few things, but we finally got an interactive visualization that we can use. Um, I'll, just give me a second. Okay, so Chief Sarah sees us and she's like, holy crap, I, uh, we'll look at this first. So this is our, our call volume. So we can look, we can see the city's changed. These, they've had these same four stations for years, but growth has come up here. We've got a large concentration in the west. Downtown is like, there's no calls. It's the safest downtown anywhere. Um, <laughs> Station four, the city's expanded out east quite a bit. So there's been a lot of changes. And so um, we show Chief Sarah this, and she's like, ah, I wish I never took this job. <laughs> um, she looks at her performance. It's a paltry 62%. And we're like, Chief Sarah, this is, we did our best. Um, and we've optimized your scenarios. And we can, we can give you a 2.8% increase in performance. But Chief Sarah is like, okay, this is great. I feel like I got some power now. And she's like, zoom into that, that downtown station. She's like, Sampty, that's like high priced land. Uh, let's, let's look at, maybe we can look at selling that station. Because I could sell that station and I could get enough money to purchase two new pieces of land and maybe open two new stations. So now I've increased my performance 7.1% and Chief Sarah is a hero. They throw her a parade. <laughs> it's awesome. She's like, I did the right thing. I did the right job. Um, and, and, then, and she has the power now. We can, you can, we can forecast from here. We can do all sorts of things. But she has the ability to communicate and play with it. And so our model's in the background, but she's empowered to, to make decisions. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> well, thanks, Rob. So some of the examples is uh, we work with cities to help them figure out where to put new stations or if they're going to get a new truck, where to put that. Yeah. Yep. Historically, we've done a lot of station reviews, and more recently, we're getting into uh, the deployment analysis. Right. Perfect. OK. So questions? Um, yeah, one is that, how do you, there's a lot of really great ways that you're uh, building a prescriptive model with, with inference there. How do you inform that model and tune it based on the ground truth of calls that are occurring? Well, Dan's going to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> Where does actual call data come in to, to play? Because you build oh, a great inferential model here and yeah. say, okay, here's where our predictive method for where we think that station should be placed, what you can do for closing old ones, opening new ones. And so, but what do you do about the calls that are coming in and have you uh, feed that into the inferential model? Right, so we, the calls tend to be sticky. The same facilities generate calls yeah. year over year at a, at a pretty sticky rate, and those stay constant over decades. And so and there's a, a CAD system, a computer aided dispatch system that sucks in every 911 call and, and categorizes and geocodes it automatically. And so you can continue to update this model. But typically, when you're doing a, a plan for a station, it's a 30-year plan. So you're looking at lots of historical data, then looking at population forecasts, and then planning around that. So it's just kind of a call density model? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, grab the back. Oh, hi. Oh, I, I can just talk really loud. Um, is there a particular reason why you went for honeycombs or the visual? The 
is. Yeah. Uh, we've we tried a few different things. We just wanted equal spacing between areas. Okay, yeah, it was just the most Yeah, and then uh, we've layered like um, boundaries on top of that. So in this case, it's you know by station, but we can change it to ward, right? If you're talking to council members, um, and then summarizing all the hexes in that area to give the you know 72 percent, 74 percent, and so we on this tool we've focused on the hexes just to give that that equal spacing. Um, yeah, it's really nice. It's pretty. One thing I could throw in there too is if you if you want to go for something like squares, what you end up is unintentionally following some of the north south yeah, east west roads, amazing. and so that sort of will bias like you'll see one big red line, yeah. and then like one big green line, and it looks like a pattern, but it's actually nothing. It's just here you hit a road, and here you haven't. Yeah, this kind of breaks it up. Yeah, w um, Magic's going to answer this one after you finish it. So, um, typically, actually, we'll connect to the RMS system. So, the CAD data is collected at the time of the call, but then the uh, uh, the officers attending the call go back and sort of clean it up a little bit, put in their notes, that kind of thing. Uh, some departments do do a better job than others, um, but we also put a lot of data cleaning on top of that. But you have access to the CAD data. Yeah. It's essential for, to the analysis, yeah. We get access, we clean it, yeah. we present the, you know, these are the calls we use, these are the calls we didn't use and why, um, and yeah, some services are a lot better than others. Back in the... Are you staying with static funds off or using any dynamic uh, This is static. Um, we, I, and I think we're going to stay with Static. There's, I mean, there's different tools out there where you can use, get in live situations and use move up models. Um, more and more, I've talked to a few chiefs, and they're like, we don't. It, it's just so complex to do live um, using a tool to do live move up things. They they push it back to their dispatch office, and the dispatch has rules that they follow. Okay, if we're down to 40% availability, we move these state these units to these stations. Um, and I think more and more chiefs are going that way. Um, and and they, they have tried, and there are some good tools out there. Dan probably wants us to go that way, but I wrestle with him and I say, no, we're, we're going to go with the strate strategic static. And most of the time, that's sufficient. Like, you don't get that much change throughout the time of day. Uh, okay, I think I have a related question. I was thinking more of uh, optimizing not the location of the uh, stations, but the location of the usual traps. I know that's impossible to have that kind of deploy in the field instead of actually being uh, you know, stationed in there. Yeah. Uh, well, well, yeah, like like outside of stations, yeah. you're saying? Yeah. Like from I, the parts, they're not waiting. Really yeah. Uh, f fire typically doesn't. I know EMS will sometimes. They'll, they'll do posts, mm -hmm. and like the ambulance will wait outside of Tim Hortons. So why wouldn't the uh, fire company do this? Well, that's a great question. Um, the water will freeze. Sometimes that's that's a problem when it gets really cold. Oh. But it's it's also a personnel issue. Like sitting in a truck, you're only busy ten or twenty percent of the time in some cities. Oh. So imagine that you sitting in front all of day, two in a truck yeah. all day. Your morale is going to sink. Oh. Yeah. But it solves so many problems. And all the special gear exactly. and all that. Exactly. Yeah. And just, yeah. What's that magic? Oh, they're also. A Got to suit up and all that. You yeah. You do that in the truck as well. So, yeah, uh, lots of variables. To okay. You have to wear your hazmat suit the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess uh, another question is uh, the microphone. Um, uh, do we take into account you know, the uh, value of the, like, I mean, human, like, what's the density of the population in a particular area? You know, like, hey, you know, the, for example, the uh, importance of this area over the other one, which is like, less well, populated, less populated. Sometimes we'll get, that's more of a political decision, right? The, you know, Ward 1 counselor is like, well, my ward is the most important, so I should get the most resources. Um, other times it's, Dan, you, 
you got well, it's something. baked into the call volumes to some degree. There are certain areas that have high population density and very low call volumes. And like young families don't generate as many calls as seniors, for instance. So your models, you have to take, there's some trade-offs you have to make. Do we make sure we're covering people in retirement centers? Are they more important than the kids pulling up fire alarms at schools? Those kinds of things. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's, that's a risk trade-off. Yeah. yeah. Okay, last question. Oh, Edgar, you uh, talk later. Um, how much proportion of the data is uh, open data and what is left to negotiate? Our road network, underlying road network, is built all on open data. Now, we used to access city data, but open data sources are just better quality at this point. Uh, call data is, is closed, right? It's their CAD system. Um, what else do we use open data for? That's about it. It's really anything geographic, all the boundaries yeah. and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But th those are really the main two sources is the call data and the geographic data. Yeah. No more? OK. OK. OK, so thanks for coming. Thanks, Rob. All right, so Diana was here from Women in Big Data, if you want to talk to her, and then Rob, and these guys will be waiting outside, and we'll see you on March 20th uh, for Undisclosed Theme. Thanks. <laughs>